Hello, everybody, and welcome to our day two of our conference, our online conference, uh, marrying the ideas of tax justice, economic justice, and climate justice, entitled How to Pay for the Climate Transition. We had a, a, an excellent day yesterday. Um, we had a lot of discussions, and underpinning our discussions yesterday were the key, were the key question of whether economic justice needs to be uh, clash with climate justice or if they can be allies and it's a very important question because if we end up having a climate transition that costs a lot of money and the people who pay for the climate transition are substantially the poorer sections of society we will see a backlash and we've already seen that in in various countries and so we need to address this urgent question where climate justice and economic justice are on the same side and so that raises the big question, how do we pay for the climate transition? Um, yesterday we had, uh, we start off with Peter Bofinger, a, a, a well-known German economist who looked at this question and uh, looked at questions like carbon taxes and private finance, but came to the conclusion that the answer really is for governments to borrow money to pay for the climate transition. And he said, there is, even though there are ideological constraints to that and old ideas about austerity being necessary in Germany and in other countries, um, governments can borrow. Governments really can borrow to do this. And the, co the coronavirus crisis has shown us that uh, governments can borrow enormous amounts of money and there'd be no signs of inflation or any of these things that the scaremongers have been telling us about. It, about. So um, that is, uh, that's one way. Um, we also had a presentation, we had various presentations, but obviously reducing carbon subsidies, subsidies to fossil fuel companies and so on, there was a lively discussion about that. There was also an inter interesting intervention from uh, Professor James Boyce, who introduced the idea of carbon dividends. And the idea there is uh, if you raise money from increasing the price of carbon, whether that's through carbon taxes or through having permits and auctioning permits, you then for political reasons, above all for political reasons, because it's so difficult to, the yellow vests in France showed us, for example, it's very difficult to raise the price of carbon. It makes a lot of people very angry and it hits poorer sections of society hardest. Um, the best way to do this is to return those, the, the revenues raised from such measures to the people on an individual basis. And that can not only um, create the political momentum and sustainability of of such policies to raise the price of carbon, but it can also be a tool for economic justice by redistributing uh, wealth from richer to poorer sections of society. So we had um, a lo lots of excellent discussion yesterday. Today, day two, we are going to substantially focus on, first of all, um, uh, what's happening in Europe, but also the financial sector, because one can argue that, oh no, the government shouldn't borrow, we should let the financial sector do it. Let's outsource it all to the financial sector. Let's um, let them do the borrowing and uh, finance our climate transition for us. So we have um, a couple of very interesting people um, to talk about that and, and also the role of neoliberalism in this whole debate and neoliberalism at the root of so much of what's, what's been going wrong in the climate uh, situation. We also then get to the question of, you know, what can we actually do about it? What can I do? What can me and my family do? Um, how do we actually move the needle on this? And I think we're now in a very fluid situation. COVID has thrown so many pieces up in the air now and so many old ether economic orthodoxies are, are finally coming into serious question among large sections of the population. So we have, um, for example, uh, Gail Bradbrook from Extinction Rebellion, who will be talking about uh, their method of changing the needle and they certainly have moved the needle in in many countries so we're we're going to have a very another very very full program today um a couple of housekeeping rules before we start um if you look on your zoom channel underneath the picture there is a chat and there is a q a you may need to expand your screen a bit to see both of those if you can't um the chat is if you want to give feedback to moderators and panelists, but we're going to have a lot, a lot of opportunities for people on the call to pose questions to the, the, the people speaking. And if you want to pose questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, we will be tweeting under the hashtag climate justice, 
and so please put that hashtag on ha hashtag on if you want to say anything about that we will also be recording the event uh, which will become available on the tax justice network youtube channel it's it, it will take a few days it may not be before the end of the year but it will become available in the end so that's my quick introduction welcome everybody um i want to now introduce our first uh, presenter sven gigold sven is um not only a well-known person in europe in his own right but he's also one of the founders of the tax justice network i remember when i joined many years ago sven gave me a slightly scary kind of interview he was sort of checking me out and he he ended up i think probably giving me the nod and i joined um and uh, he but he he has been involved in many many uh movements that have really been at the beginning of um really early stage movements that have really challenged the consensus out there and been seen in the early days as kind of utopian but have now kind of been vindicated by events. Um, he's also spokesperson for the German Greens in the European Parliament. He's chair of the Green Group in the Committee on Economic and Financial Policy, um, member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. And he is an economist by background, uh, a political economist. So uh, he is able to see the dimensions beyond the mere formulae and numbers and to see how this affects broader, broader societies. So Sven, um, I would like to, to give the floor to you now. Um, if you could just say say a, a few words, maybe maybe speak for ten minutes or so um, about uh, is the European uh, Green Deal is it new? Is it green? Is it a deal? Um, what's going on? How are we doing? And and where could we go next? So over to you, Sven. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the kind words uh, and uh, must have been an awful interview in the beginning. Well, uh, Germans are often less polite uh, than what we were used traditionally uh, from, from Britain. Uh, however, um, the real power relations uh, in the tax justice network were, of course, that we were doing what John was saying, uh, and uh, he deserves most of the honor. Uh, uh, probably also was also true when it came to you. However, uh, having said that, look, um, where are we with uh, what is called the Green Deal, Green New Deal? First of all, um, 2019, the year of the last election, saw um, after the election, a new commission, which has put the Green Deal at the center uh, of the new strategy of the commission. And, uh, and obviously this is a bit confusing because it is called a green deal while many progressives, also the European Green Party, but also the movement around Tsipras, just a moment. Um, and uh, this was a noisy cat, uh, but uh, the... Um, so several movements demanded a Green New Deal. Uh, already since um, the global financial crisis, the, de the concept was developed by various economists, came originally from UNEP, uh, the environmental program of the United Nations, and uh, basically making reference uh, to the New Deal after the last global financial crisis, the response uh, planned and uh, to large extent also implemented by Roosevelt and, uh, and basically transforming that into an area of environmental scarcity and climate crisis. Uh, so this idea of the Green New Deal of rebalancing some of the big imbalances of the global economy while at the same time tackling the issue of green investment and green change in order to put our economy back into the limits of the planet. This um, approach was suggested by many, but never had a political majority, neither after the last financial crisis, uh, nor now. One has to be very clear about this, because when the new commission came up with a green deal, they didn't mean a green new deal they meant a Green Deal. The big difference is the Green Deal is 
the announcement of a huge environmental and climate driven policy set, which is demanding. We just saw today that the heads of state um, su suggest and supported a climate a target of minus 55% at least until 2030, up from 40%. There is some fiddling with the numbers, but nevertheless, it's a higher ambition. The European Parliament wants minus 60%. So there is a high climate ambition, and there's also the willingness to use legislative instruments to realize this ambition. So we will see new EU legislation in a long list of fields in order to transform the way how we work and produce and consume in an environmental sense. Uh, so this is nothing small. It's nothing to be cynical about. It is something of which we can truly say that elections and movements make a difference. So in particular, the movement of the young, the Fridays for Future movement uh, has had a huge influence over this new strategy of the Commission, and it will lead to a massive increase of investment, uh, also industrial investment, in order to green our economies. But, but it is not a new deal. Why is it not a new deal? The old idea of the new deal and also the different conceptions of the green new deal included much more. They were also plans to rebalance the economy to limit social inequality. They were also instrumental in order to shrink the space of financial capital in the interest of capital invested in the real economy. And um, they also wanted to increase the share of the state uh, in comparison to private investment. And uh, all this is not part of the, of the Green Deal, which we are seeing at the moment uh, as lead strategy for the Commission. The Green Deal is a strategy which has been accepted by the centre-right in Europe, but never loved. But there's a solid majority for this Green Deal uh, in the European institutions. But there is by, by far no majority for something like a Green New Deal. Uh, this is uh, why not to give up on the ideas of a New Deal. I think that would be totally wrong. Economic inequalities persist. Dangers from the financial sector have only been covered. They are not solved. Um, and also, there are very strong reasons why we need more public infrastructure and uh, institutions in order to keep our economies together. Uh, therefore, the old story of the New Deal is still very much needed, but um, nevertheless, it is worth implementing also the Green Deal, because uh, for this we have at the moment majorities. For a New Deal type of rebalancing, we need to continue working to build these majorities. When it comes now to the core, and this is what, with what I would like to close, when we now come to the key mission of the Tax Justice Network, for which we worked together, and, um, and I'm now working in the Parliament, we have a really interesting situation. So on the one hand, in the program of the Commission, there's relatively little on taxation and on closing tax havens and uh, ending the harmful race to the bottom and corporate taxation and all this. There's relatively little. It's not a big ambition. But with the Corona crisis, we have a new situation. I thought after the elections, hmm, last mandate in the Juncker Commission, ironically, we had achieved quite a lot of progress in Europe when it came to fight against um, uh, tax evasion and tax aggressive tax avoidance and for tax justice. But some of the key proposals are still blocked in council. They have a majority in parliament, but they don't achieve the necessary consensus uh, in a council. Uh, but now with the Corona crisis, and I thought after the elections, okay, it will be very hard to re-dynamize an ambition 
to really achieve um, tax cooperation in Europe have a truly global approach to closing the shell company networks and, and you know all the story. But now with Corona, we have a profoundly different situation. We have the ambition uh, of the state to tackle the climate crisis. We have new social needs. We have big damages in our economies. And at the same time, the, the state uh, has problems uh, to find income. Obviously, Peter Bofinger can say you can borrow, true, uh, but at the same time, we also will have to have additional tax income. And uh, in such a situation as we are now, it is very difficult to tax ordinary people more. Certainly, there are some rich people, but in particular, there are the big tax loopholes there's the tax competition race to the bottom. And therefore, I, I think we have a historical opportunity now to fulfill our founding mission as a tax justice network, to get real minimum tax rates, to get formula apportionment, to get real taxation of digital giants and close in the financial secrecy worlds of shell companies and loopholes in the global in the global automatic information exchange regime, uh, which is our uh, fruit also of our work. And uh, I presented yesterday at the OECD a seven point um, program, no, on Wednesday, a seven point program, how to fix the loopholes uh, of the CRS, of the global automatic information exchange regime in tax matters. And in Europe, we have a new subcommittee we have a new tax observatory led by Professor Zuckman. We have a real chance to build a broad majority in order to fulfill our founding mission as a tax justice network. And I think this is a moment too good to waste. Uh, now it's the time to deliver for tax justice, at least that part of the New Deal idea. We have a chance to realize. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sven. Um, so we have uh, 10 minutes. I'm just going to um, put a quick question in there. The difference between the green, the concept of a Green New Deal and a Green Deal as we've seen it, um, to what extent do you think this is going to end up being a regressive? Um, you know, it, it will raise, it will achieve a substantial climate uh, justice set of goals, but will it Will it also achieve economic justice? To what extent will that happen? To what extent do you think it's going to be regressive? Well, I, I must say, I believe if it's truly regressive, it will not happen. As you were saying in the opening, we have seen it very clearly without justice, uh, no climate uh, change, no tackling of the climate crisis. Totally clear. Uh, however, will there be everybody winning? No. Uh, I don't believe that, and I don't think that uh, the state can deliver on this uh, fully. So we, for it, I, I, I speak first about my own country, Germany. Germany is depending on very much on the car industry. And it's even worse, we are depending very much on building dirty cars, uh, polluting cars. When we transform this industry, there is a chance of building new sustainable products, yes. But there will also be companies losing. And not for everyone, we will have an equal, equally well-paying job. And who believes we can only tackle the climate crisis if everybody feels socially better afterwards, this will not be the case. Climate change means a huge adaptation effort and this will also hit some individuals. But overall, inequality must rather be contained. Otherwise, it will not happen. But we should not promise that everybody will be better off afterwards. Uh, this would be an easily refutable lie. OK, um, there's a question come in here. Um, one is a bit UK specific. I'll keep it general. There's one from Johanna Alberti. Um, tax justice obviously is essential, but will it be a distraction from governments putting money into climate change resilience, which they can do without tax or even, in fact, borrowing? Um, that's the question that came in. 
Yes, as I tried to indicate, I'm a bit, I, I, I try to generalize it even more. There are some people who say, uh, take the argument to the extreme. Only if we tackle uh, capitalism, we will be able to achieve uh, our climate objectives. So the radical wing of the movement is basically saying we need a totally new economic model. Otherwise, we will not achieve. We first have to break uh, the dynamics of economic growth. If we don't do that, we will not win on climate change. For me, this is another way of committing suicide. I put it really political. I believe this is not working. We have 10 years to bring our emissions down. If we don't, climate science tells us rightly, we will hit the tipping points and it will become really dangerous, really dangerous. And, and this means we will have to make at least a big chunk of the necessary change inside of the current economic system whether we like it or not. And we have to build our alliances inside of this economic and democratic system. This means we have to also ride the tiger. Uh, therefore, I'm against conditioning the things. So this means we are in favor of climate action, but we are also in favor of tax justice and limiting inequalities. And we have to fight that at the same time. And ideally, of course, think about uh, the interrelations, but we should not say only if all this, 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 this is achieved at the same time, we vote uh, for the necessary climate laws. No, uh, we continue these different struggles, we network them where needed, but we should not claim that uh, we first have to need a big revolution before we can rescue our lives. This would be the wrong logic. Okay, and following on from that, um, again, a general question. It comes back to this question of what can I do? What can we do as a movement? I mean, the tax justice movement had, you know, from its early days was very quite heavily focused on tax havens and it'd be very successful in raising awareness and, and engaging on these, these issues. Um, but, but fairly soon, it was impossible to engage on this without engaging in the issue of finance justice, of looking at the financial sector, the financial system, and what we call the finance curse. Um, we also see the importance of engaging on climate justice, everybody does. Um, and you know, this is obviously part of that. Have you, on the other hand, in the climate justice movement, have you seen a similar kind of um, attempt to, to, to be an evolution? To what extent has there been an evolution towards embracing the economic justice side? Um, and if that has been problematic, what are the levers that we can use to sort of build a bridge and sort of push this forward so that we really do have a kind of joining of economic justice and, and climate justice? What can we practically do to, to, you know, change the story? Well, to me, the biggest issue here is, of course, uh, the question of carbon pricing. Uh, why? Uh, because without a price on CO2, we will not achieve you cannot protect only by regulation and lifestyle change a free good. Uh, the, the atmosphere is a free good, it has to be priced. So CO2 has to be priced. But when we use pricing in order to limit the access to the scarce resource of our atmosphere, it will of course relatively hit the poorer harder while the rich can buy out of their lifestyle change. And uh, that will create a new dimension of social uh, cleverage of, uh, so of a social divide. And therefore, I think it is so crucial to get this carbon pricing right. And this means, uh, and I think there is also a flagship uh, project, also for a movement like the Tax Justice Network, uh, to say, look, we take the income uh, from the carbon pricing, but we give it out as a dividend per capita so that people, we call this energy money in German. It sounds nicer in German than it does in English. You have to do the right translation. Uh, so if you have, or you could say it's an energy basic income. So everyone receives the same amount. And this will of course mean that after introducing something which is by design a regressive tax, like taxing carbon, you have afterwards, after redistribution by capita, you have actually less inequality than before. 
and uh, and it's well and that sort of projects are needed so that it's not a general blah blah social and environment all together climate justice social justice together but it has to be symbolized by specific projects and and there are more projects of that kind but to me this energy basic income combined with the co2 pricing is an economically and socially efficient idea and it could also mobilize okay uh, we at the tax justice network are very interested in that idea and we'd like to follow it up with you sven um uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that later but um I, I guess we've got time for about one more question there's quite a few questions come in now uh this one is from chris morgan do you think it is possible to find ways to encourage private investment in the green recovery while limiting the risk of socializing losses and privatizing any gains no well it, the green deal for good reasons is mainly a private investment program i think who believes that um, transforming our economies as they are uh, being based mainly on public investment i think that is wrong public investment has a role to play there are lots of infrastructure spending there's spending in order to help people reskilling uh, that so there's a there's a case for regional policy and so on but but at its core it will be private companies investing into new business models and it will be pri private companies who, who have to leave fossil business models and that that is the reason at least in the german greens our strength is very much based on the support on the one hand of civil society but more and more by businesses which have understood that if they want to be successful in the future we need a much more radical green policy uh, in in europe and in germany and this is why an alliance between those businesses which have understood and civil society it is a potential and i do not believe in um in a green deal in in a climate change um, economy a, a driven economy which uh, is based only on public investment that is uh, it will mainly be private actors who have to do the change Okay, um, I think we are getting towards the end of our session now. Um, I just want to offer you the chance, Sven, is, is there anything else you'd like to add, the questions that we haven't asked? Oh, look, certainly, but we have a discussion afterwards with my great uh, lost colleague, Molly Scott Cato, and everything uh, I can say there. Thank you for yeah. your time. Okay, well, thanks very much, Sven, it's been fascinating. So now um, we are going to hand over to, to the next uh, panel discussion and uh, uh, scenting profits, neoliberalism, and the Wall Street climate cons consensus with a, with a Q&A session. Um, thanks to all those who gave questions. Sorry I couldn't ask all of, all of the questions. Um, and I'll hand over now to the next panel.